John 17, if you would. John 17. And what I want to do tonight is I, I want to read most of it from the beginning and uh, we'll go through and, and just sort of read this together as uh, Jesus Christ's prayer for his disciples. If you just kind of flip forward here uh, in John, this is John 17. By the time we get to John 19, you notice the second word in John chapter 19, verse 1, Pilate. What does that mean? That means that we are just a few teachings away from the time when Jesus is going to be held under trial and then he's going to be crucified. So let's Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and let's ask his blessing um, and ask God's grace uh, again tonight for the service, for me, uh, that God would open up our eyes and we would see wondrous things from God's word. John chapter 17, uh, verse 1. These uh, words spake Jesus uh, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should uh, give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know uh, thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee uh, on, on the earth, I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That verse still gets me. I love that verse. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast uh, given me out of the world. Um, thine they were, and thou hast given them me and they have kept thy word. The true sign of someone who is born again, who is living the life of faith that God has called us to, is that they keep God's word. Somebody say amen. My, uh, uh, my aunt Mary Jo that was just here, um, you didn't have to ask her twice what Bible she used. King James, she said. And, uh, I, well, you know what? I'll go ahead and tell you a story she told. In the modern translations, you remember the story of the Pool of Siloam, where the story was that at a certain time of the year, an angel came down and stirred the waters. And whoever could be in the waters first after the angel stirred the waters, they would be healed. Well, she said her Sunday school teacher started uh, going on about how the scholars have gone over this story. And the scholars have decided that there's a pretty good chance that this story never really occurred that the scholars said that there really wasn't an angel that would show up and stir the waters and if if i'm right i think the new translations have omitted that story or at least a great portion of that story and my aunt bless her heart uh she sat there and listened to that and listened to that and listened to that until she could listen to it no more and she stood up in class and she said, it wasn't me that was talking. She said, it was whatever was inside of me talking and saying, listen, I don't put my faith in scholars. I don't put my faith in people who, who where the Bible says one thing, but men say another. I put my faith and my trust in the word of God. And if the word of God says an angel came down and stirred the waters, then by heaven, I believe that angels come down and stirred the waters. And I mean, she just went, yeah. And she said, you know what? When I got home and thought all about it, she said, 
I wasn't sorry one bit that I did that. Amen. Bless her heart. So anyway, um, now you done lost my place here. I guess verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, with, uh, with thee before the world was. I manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast given me, but out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. You see, when I read the Bible, I don't doubt that these things came from God. I don't have to ask God 20 times, God, are you sure you said this? For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Uh, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, and if you haven't done it already, I want you to underline Holy Father. I'm going to deal, I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. And keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them uh, is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Uh, and now I come to thee, and, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou uh, shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Boy, that is a... That's a big verse there. The general idea is that before any evil comes to the earth, that God is going to take all of the saints out of the world in order to keep them from receiving any harm whatsoever. Um, and I was telling my uh, aunt about the trials that I had endured at times going to Kenya. And I said twice on two different, two different occasions, I had devils just barking in my ear, telling me to leave, telling me I was in danger telling me that I wasn't going to live, that I didn't belong there. And she asked me, she said, did you rebuke them in the name of Jesus? Uh, and, and I said, no, the only thing that I could think to do at the time was to make a phone call to God and say, God, they're bothering me. And their bothering is getting worse and worse and worse. And I can't do anything about it. So, Father, I need you to help me. I have a story about that here. If you'll, I'll try to remember it here in a minute. Uh, verse 16. My wife was with me during this. This happened yesterday. Uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. And definitely underline this in your Bible. Thy word is truth. Remember what Pontius Pilate asked Jesus when Jesus began talking about the truth? 
Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? He had been raised uh, in a mindset. There were dozens and dozens of different gods. He probably, even though it might have been required of him, it might have made him look good to see him saluting the various statues of gods around the Roman Empire, but he, he probably doubted that any of those pillars of rocks that look like men and women and so on had any real power. And so Pontius Pilate, of course, would say the words, what is truth? Because to him, there are no absolutes. Absolutely, there are no absolutes. And here Jesus is saying, Thy word is truth. It's the only truth. Um, as thou hast sent me uh, into the world, even so have I also sent them in, into the world. And for their sakes, um, I'm have this red letter edition Bible is faded, so I'm having a little hard time reading it in this light. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall, shall, future tense, believe on me through their word. That they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee and that they also uh, may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be um, one even as we are one I in them Thou in me, that they may uh, be made perfect in one. And that the world may um, know that thou had sent me and hast loved me as thou hast, lo uh, hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whether thou hast given me uh, to be with uh, well, let me read that again. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold thy glory, or my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou believest me. Good grief. For thou lovest me before the um, foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have uh, declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that, thou, uh, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. And Father, we open, ask, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to wondrous things. Help us to behold wondrous things out of thy law. We ask, dear God, that you would uh, uh, forgive us of our sins. Father, Lord, that you would just bless this service. Bless the teaching of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I want to go back to, um, you know what, I'm going to pull that up on my, I don't have my pure Bible search software going on this so let me let me do that let me open that up here i might have a better time reading it there's something about this red letter edition and it's faded and this lighting in here is a yellowish light and i'm having a hard time reading it uh tonight john chapter 17 here we go Either that or I'd probably need to get new glasses. I don't know. All right, here we go. 
Now I want to focus tonight on what Jesus called God in this verse right here. He said, and, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And I want you to understand, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I, I don't think I've really gone uh, really into depth with it. And to share some of the things that I know from the Word of God, that when I read this, and why I get so angry, why I get uh, upset about it, why it bothers me so much, uh, in that we have not just 1.2 billion Roman Catholics or people who would claim to be Roman Catholics on this earth who are told to refer to the Pope as Holy Father and, and not just as a not just as a special name to be uh, used only in certain ceremony or certain rituals or certain liturgies but any time the Pope is addressed personally by his, by his uh, cardinals, by his bishops, by the various priests that live in the Vatican or the various priests that come and, and visit from all over the world, or by uh, millions and millions of faithful Roman Catholics who make a pilgrimage to the Vatican every year just so they can see uh, St. Peter's Basilica, just so they can see, maybe get a glimpse of the Pope. Uh, every Wednesday, the Pope does uh, what's called a papal audience, and he does it in the papal audience hall, and believe it or not, and I've done this uh, on a video here a while back, that papal audience hall looks like the, the head and the mouth and the eyes of a serpent. Somebody showed me that one day and I went, oh, surely that's not. And when I got to looking at it, I'm going, oh, yeah. His audience hall that he goes into every Wednesday and he gives off some little uh, spiritual speech, I guess. Maybe it's supposed to be a sermon. I don't know. Gives off some little spiritual speech. Says some nice words about everybody. About how uh, you can do this. And about how you can do that. And about how the saints are watching over you. And Mary will help you with this. And, and on and on and on. And he gives blessings to certain people. There's always people there that he's going to give special blessings to. Or special graces to. Or maybe he's going to kiss uh, their uh, their rosary, or he's going to he's going to bless their crucifix, so that and they believe this now. They believe that if that pope blesses their crucifix, if they're wearing it when they're saved, they got absolutely nothing to worry about. They have all their sins forgiven, and they're going to heaven to imme immediately. But he is commonly and daily referred to as. Santa Papa, Santa Padre, which basically means Holy Pope or Holy Father. It, and this place right here, I'll type it in for you so you'll know, the phrase Holy Father is only mentioned one time in the King James Bible and it's only mentioned in that spot right there, John 17, 11. In other words, this was a, a title that was so special to, to God, to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit, that it's only used one time in the Scripture, and it only refers to God the Father, and it was given by God 
the Son. Let me tell you what that uh, let me tell you what that is in the Bible. Let me type in this word here. There is a scripture in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 that talks about Jesus Christ. And there, of course, those, the, uh, the, um, your, um, well, who, what am I trying to think of? Jehovah's Witness, do not believe that Jesus is God Almighty. In fact, your Mormons do not believe that Jesus is is one with the Father. They do not believe that He is the Almighty God, even though the Bible specifically ascribes that title to Jesus Christ. In fact, it was prophesied in Isaiah, and His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, He meant exactly that. So in uh, Philippians 2, turn there in your Bibles. Philippians 2. We'll start reading in verse 4 to get the context of it. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. We're, um, remember, on Sunday mornings, we're preaching on the, on the mind. And I've, uh, I've sort of just kind of been given the, um, oh, I guess the, the negative part of it, the negative side of it, how uh, people have corrupt minds that think corrupt things. And when you think corrupt things, you do corrupt things. Who in here believes that if you spend a lot of time thinking about bad things, that at some point, to some degree, you will end up doing those bad things? Who believes that? I do. I do. Okay. Um... I not only believe it, I've practiced it. Okay? But look what he says. Look not on every man. As, but there's another part to this sermon on the mind that I want to get to. Look not every man on his own things. But every man also on the things of, the, of others. Now that does not mean be a busybody in everybody else's affairs. Don't get involved in everybody's business. Don't be nosy about what they're doing. Don't try to be looking over their shoulder all the time to see what they're typing out in a text message. Don't be trying to listen to other people's goings on and so on. But what it means is that if you hear someone in the church that has a need, that means look to that. That means... Ponder that and say, God, how can I help this person? God, how can I, what, what can I do that would not offend them, but would be a blessing to them? Um, so he says here in verse 5, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not, robbery to be equal with God. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you how uh, I'm going to show you how corrupt these other Bibles are. Um, let's go to Blue Letter Bible. Letter Bible. Dot, what is it? O-R-G. There we go. I'm going to change that to... The, come on here. I'm going to change that to the NIV. If it'll let me. For crying out loud. Oh, let me get rid of that. Hang on. Where 
Where is it? Where is it? There it is. NIV. What verse did we just read? Philippians 2.6. 6. So... Just type in Philippians 2. Who being, this is what the NIV says in that verse. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, yeah, it is weird. And you know what? If you have an NIV from, let's say, 1990. Your NIV from 1990 will not even match this current NIV version. Um, because the NIV of 1990 says that he thought that being equal with God, something not to be attained to. Which is the opposite of he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Here it says... Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That's, re that's, uh, anyway. So now watch this. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's verse 7. So while Jesus was God and he knew he was God, did he think that he was in some way being disobedient to think of himself as being equal with God? And the answer is no. Guys, pay attention. Thank you very much. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he did not think that he was doing something wrong or evil when people bowed down to him and said, Thou art the Son of the living God, or Thou art God, or whatever. Jesus didn't think anything of it. He received their praise. He received them bowing down to him because he was God. He was their creator. Now, so if, if anybody could be using or should be using um, the idea of being uh, equal with God or being called Holy Father or using the phrase Holy Father, it would be Jesus and there'd be no question about it whatsoever. But for a, a mortal man to take upon himself the idea, I'm not even going to use that right now, take upon himself the idea that he is the Holy Father here on this earth is nothing short of blasphemy. Uh, let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter 3. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little trip through the Bible, and I'm going to show you that there is one who is not God, he is not Almighty, He is not ever present, omnipresent. He does not know everything. He's not omniscient. He is not all powerful, which He is not omnipotent. He does not have the characteristics of God, yet He believes Himself to be God and to be equal with God, and He wants others to believe. That he is equal with God. So in Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye should not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent right here, right now, is going to assume an identity that is not just equal with God, but superior to God. 
When he says in verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. At this point, Satan has not made himself equal with God. He has made himself and his ideas superior to God by, by directly contradicting God. And then he's going to add on to it by revealing a doctrine that he believes mankind should know that God won't tell everybody. And believe it or not, there are people all over this world. Those who practice Hindu, Buddhism, Sikhism, a lot of the, um, the Eastern type religions, Eastern mysticism and so on, they worship God as a serpent. The serpent is there. In fact, in India, one of the favorite gods of, um, of the Indians is a serpent with seven heads. That's exactly how John described the dragon, which is the devil. He said he's got seven heads. So talk about blatantly worshiping Satan himself. Uh, I often wonder, you know, we have, um, we've had in the past in, in the Free Will Baptist denomination we used to belong to, uh, they would send missionaries to India uh, to try to convert people to Christianity. For the most part, those missionaries' work was very difficult and it produced little results. In fact, there, was, there came a time in India when if you applied to get a visa to India as a missionary, a Christian missionary, you would be denied that visa. They did not want any Christian missionaries in India. In fact, let me, let me just share this with you tonight. Before the British took over India and ran it as a colony of the British Empire, India had almost no public health facilities. India had almost no um, charitable organizations whereby they ministered food to starving people, uh, basic health or medicines to those who were extremely poor. India had almost none of that present. Do you know why? Karma. The Indian religion being based upon their Hindu religion, the idea that if you were born into an impoverished family, it was because the gods had decided that you needed to live a life of abject poverty and suffering. So that when you died out of that life and were resurrected into the next life, you might straighten up a little bit and live better so that you would not be subjected to yet another life of abject poverty. Now, so if you were, if you were a beggar in the streets, and I mean every, what is it, rubles in India? Every, every penny that you could beg from somebody in India might be just 
enough money for you to buy the, the smallest amount of food possible. And nobody with any wealth whatsoever dared ever have compassion on you and give you more because they believed that karma was responsibility for you living that life and they did not interfere with your karma. And so therefore, in their eyes, you deserve to live a life of poverty and that's what you were going to do. When the British showed up and they found out all this, they were appalled. Absolutely disgusted. The British Empire was, by at least on the outside, a Christian civilization. And so as soon as they came and took over India and colonized it, that's some of the first things they did. Number one, they started building hospitals. They started having food distribution programs that would distribute food to people who literally were starving to death because of the karmic system. Okay? It just it, it makes you angry to see that people, because of their religion, would allow the people around them to suffer and sometimes in horrible ways and then die and their life be absolutely meaningless to you because of that karma-based religion. And so here is the serpent now claiming that he has a better doctrine. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die for God doth know in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So the devil now is taking over the place of God. Turn to, um, turn to Isaiah. Some of you um, probably know where I'm going to go on some of this, but it's going to, we're going to put it in a different context. We're going to understand exactly why um, these things are written for us in our Bibles. Isaiah chapter 14. Just as the Pope demands to be called by the title Holy Father. Uh, I'll give it to you in a different way. Um, there are people who used to belong to secret societies such as Freemasonry. In a secret society, when you are going through the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees... You are blindfolded and when you are brought into the lodge room, they tell you to kneel, even though you can't see what you're kneeling in front of. And when you kneel and they finally take that blindfold off you, you find that you are knelt in front of a man sitting on a throne who is called the worshipful master of the lodge. Now, what did Jesus say about having a master? No man can serve two masters. And I'm, we're going to go down and see Brother Reg Kelly this weekend. Reg, Reg told me that uh, his dad, of course his dad's repented of this, but years ago, his dad was a Freemason, and he said, Son, you need to join the lodge. Reg said, I was lost. I was lost. And they led me into that place. They had me blindfolded and uh, all this stuff that they had going on. And they told me to say this and recite this and say this and say this and say this. And finally, they told me to kneel. And I knelt. And he said, They took that off of me. And they said, now this is the worshipful master that you're to give obeisance to. It's just a man sitting on the throne. But that man represents somebody. Represents Lucifer. And Red said, I was lost. 
And recognize that you can't serve two masters. He said, I've been in church all my life and I knew you couldn't serve two masters. And so any Christian, I, I just don't understand how any man who claims to be a born again Christian can go into a lodge room, have the blindfold on, the blindfold taken off, and they are knelt and they vow a vow to this worshipful master, knowing that Jesus said no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and hold to the other, or he will love the one and despise the other. And I, I, I get it. I don't see. And I, when I, I made a video on this several years ago, and you know what? A guy wrote me. And he said, Pastor Mike, thank you. He said, now I get it. And he said, I've sent a letter to my lodge. And he said, I'm not ever going back ever again. He said, you're exactly right. He said, I was trying to live two lives. I was trying to live a Christian life. And I was trying to live a Masonic life. And he said, here I am bowing or trying to have two masters in my life. Two rabbis, two teachers, two lords, two gods telling me what to do. And he said, I'm not serving both of them. I'm only going to serve one. He came and visited this church several years ago. And I'd, I'd praise the Lord for that. But it's the idea in Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, what Lucifer says in his heart that God knows what's going on. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will sit, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, call me Holy Father. For I am like the most high. Turn to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. There we have an, an almost identical statement made by what the Bible calls the, the, uh, the Prince of Tyrus. The Prince is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. By the way, I believe that there will come a time when the devil will cause all of mankind to say, I am God. I am God. John Denver, in the, in the very beginning, in the height of his popularity, Life magazine did an, uh, uh, an article on John Denver detailing his life and how he came from uh, uh, his father was an Air Force. Does anybody know John Denver's real name? Uh, I don't either. Apparently, I used to know what it was. It was um, Dusendorf. John, can you imagine record albums all over the country with John Duschendorf on it? So they, he changed his name to Denver. But anyway, John Denver belonged because of his money and his popularity and his love for nature. He lived there in Aspen, Colorado. In fact, he made Aspen what it is now. It's just a, a, a billionaire's play area is what it is. But uh, Denver belonged to uh, a New Age uh, group called Erhard Seminary Training. It was led by a German New Ager by the name of Werner Erhard. And John Denver said in this Life magazine article, he said, I believe that I will be a God one of these days. He died in a plane accident. Uh, in Ezekiel 28, the prince of Tyrus says in verse 2, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart 
of God to call any man worshipful master, holy father, Santa Papa, Santa Claus, just doesn't, that doesn't jive with God. And then uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul warned us about this. He said, I've already warned you, I've already told you this was coming. He said, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know what? What is perdition? What is perdition? Perdition is hell. So what is what is it saying here? He's not the son of heaven. Jerusalem above, which is the mother of us all. He's the son of. So it says. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he is God. Sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. God and in your King James those are all capital G's he is going to convince people that he is God I would like to see this God um, Take a dead man, raise him back to life again. I'd like to see this God man take lame people and raise them up out of their, their beds or their wheelchairs. I'd like for this, this God man to go into every hospital in the world and set every body free and heal all their diseases. That's what I would like to see, which it's not going to happen. But you know what? There's going to be countless billions of people who are going to believe the words of this infidel, just like they believe the Pope. When they call him Holy Father, Santa Papa, or Santa Padre, or whatever it is in any other language. Um, those people who refer to a man in this world as that. When that man, Pope Francis, to my knowledge, he's not performed any great miracles. He's not risen people from the dead. He's not healed blind people and lame people. He's, he doesn't have any miracles that I'm aware of. He's just another con man in a white dress. White skirt. And a white hat. Fooling billions of people all over the world. He is not God. And he never will be. Aren't you glad you're not Roman Catholic? Say amen. Amen.